Stand by. This is Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel for SMEs, business owners, and entrepreneurs. Streaming live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. The live show is made possible by our sponsor, Restream, the easy way to stream to multiple social platforms at the same time. Restream Studio makes it simple to go live directly from your browser. Get started now at businessconnectionslive.com forward slash restream. And now, here's Steve Highland. Hello there. Welcome along. It is Business Connections Live, the program for entrepreneurs, SMEs and business owners. We've got a a real belter of a program coming up for you today. If you've ever thought about starting your own podcast, if that's something that's been mulling around in the back of your mind over the last couple of months, maybe over the past couple of years, and you think maybe now is the right time to be doing that. But where do I start? What can I achieve with it? Then you're in exactly the right place today because I've got one of the um, world's leaders when it comes to podcast production and how to create, develop and deliver a podcast for your business that's going to be successful. How are you, Steve? Good to be here today. I mean, a long, illustrious career. Uh, 12 years you've been doing this, so you're, you're no fly in the Flying the night operation, are you? 2008, you kicked off your first uh, podcast and you were monetizing them from the very beginning. You've written books, you've trained people on it. You run uh, the Industry Thought Leader Academy. You've written books, as I said, that are available that tell you how to go about doing this. It's quite an illustrious career. For those people that don't know a lot about you, just give us a brief background as you see it from 2008 to now now okay well thank you so much for the opportunity so back in 2008 i was working in the career industry and for those of us who remember back that time it was when the global financial crisis hit and a colleague who was also in the career industry different business to me so we were separate businesses we were very disillusioned at the doom and gloom that mainstream media across all platforms radio television print uh, was sharing and we knew that things were tough we knew that job opportunities were scarce but we also knew that there was a way to tap into the hidden job market. And if people continue to listen to the doom and gloom, that would inhibit their ability to succeed in the job market. We had no idea what we were doing, but one day I heard about this online blog talk radio was the let's start a radio show. Back then it wasn't really called podcasting. So we did. We had no idea what we were doing. Thankfully though, my co-host, my colleague, had spent 12 months learning how to be um, a radio host. He was told at the end of that 12 months, you've got a squeaky voice for radio, so this is not really the best career for you. He never but got took, over that. They took the money. Though. They took the money, though. I bet you when they were training him, didn't they? Yeah, we got oh, your absolutely. money. You're just not going to succeed, mate. <laughs> Exactly. So we did that for two years. We met incredible people from around the world because what we did was we reached out to other job uh, job seekers who would come and listen to the show. We'd ask them, who do you want to talk to? What are some of the topics you would like us to share? And we'll also seek other career professionals. So we built a network of uh, stakeholders and, and other influencers within the career space. But one of the things that we struggled was to monetize because back then there really was no such thing as podcasting. The audience was a lot smaller. So if you compared it to what was working very well back then was mainstream radio, you would know that because you that's your background. So mm-hmm. when anyone was thinking about monetizing, they instantly thought of advertising sponsorships. And we just didn't have the numbers as far as audience was concerned. So we parted ways. I would had a podcast always uh, in my business. I transitioned from careers working with executives and professionals to working with ex- uh, entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who'd gone from the glass ceiling and thought, you know what, I've got a lot of expertise. I want to now start my own business. And of course, needed to learn how do I market myself. And Women in Leadership was the first podcast where I really started to to see uh, monetization.
organization ability. And, and I'll share a story, and I know that we shared this online before we went live, Steve, mm -hmm. was I'd just come out of a business partnership that had failed. I won't go into the details, but I thought at that time, 2014, 2015, I can't write content. I was burnt out. I thought, you know what, but I love asking questions. So I'm going to start Women in Leadership podcast. Go out, find inspiring women who are really just succeeding in their life and in their business and their career, and I'm going to interview them. Three episodes in, I accidentally made two four-figure clients, and I thought if I could do that by accident for a show that I created kind of as a selfish reason to get over my own loss, imagine what would happen if I did that intentionally and could I do that. So a book, a program, and, and many years later, uh, now that's what I'm teaching and podcasting with purpose was born. And so I've always loved the medium. I mean, you obviously know just how powerful it is to be able to create a level of engagement. And I love all social media have been, you know, videoing, now live streaming, but I've never really had a medium that enables the connection with an audience. I don't know if you've probably had the same thing. There's just something quite intimate when you spend well, time. I, I must admit, I, th I think I've been very lucky in my career. H having done both radio, where you can be very one-to-one, -one, you can cuddle up to the microphone and you can whisper in your listener's ear. You can really do that and it can be very, very intimate. The other thing that was interesting, doing shopping TV, shopping telly, uh, that too can be quite intimate because you are talking to to one person. You are convincing a single person, not a group, but you're saying, look, imagine how you're going to feel when you're wearing th this ring or when you use this piece of equipment or when you're baking in your, in your kitchen with this different kind of pan. It is all very one-to-one. -one, and it seems to me the biggest issue at the moment is that people don't talk to one, they talk to many. And maybe that's the fault of, you know, people coming from keynote backgrounds, you know, where they are speakers on stage, where they are talking to a group of people and they've been told that they've got to move their eyes to engage with everybody. Uh, maybe that's where the, the issues are coming in. But the linguistics that have been used, I think, at the moment, both on podcasts and on videocasts and programmes like this, they all tend to be to groups and not to the singular. I mean, I, I don't know how you feel. Do you agree with that? I do. And I've always said to people, speak to an audience of one. And the amount of times that I have had feedback, and I'm sure you have had two, Steve, where people have said, oh, I just loved how you shared that story, that you're sharing my life. And that moved me so much. So, And I've even had one uh, person who was listening to my podcast, she became a client. And I've got so many stories that way. She was in the gym listening to one of my podcasts. She had to stop. She was on the treadmill. She had to stop. She just burst into tears. I was interviewing a guest and it was a very emotional story. And she was just so moved. She had to go and excuse herself to the toilet where she said, I just burst out into tears. That's the kind of relationship that you can build. You can move people. And, you know, you can if you really know who your audience is and you speak to them, that speak to that audience of one. So I totally agree. If you were starting today, do you, do you think you'd have the same success as you had then? Because we, we were talking about this before we came on air. And there is a lot of noise out there. There is a lot of noise. Everybody is clamoring for a little bit of the action. Everybody wants you wants to share their it, you, their ears with your ears. Uh, if you were starting today, would you do it differently? Would you do, how would you approach it today? Do you think? And, and are numbers important? Do you think as well? I'm uh, glad you asked, and I'll, I'll answer that uh, in two separate uh, responses. So firstly, yes, I would do things differently, and I do do things differently, so I teach things differently too. So what I did when I when I did a backtrack and I looked at all of the steps, there were certain uh, things that had to be there. For instance, being on brand. And what I mean by on brand, being consistent in the message, being consistent in the, the experience that I create, so much so that someone may listen to the podcast, go and watch a video, into engage with me on a post or something like that. But there's consistency of that brand message. I'm also speaking very narrowly and deeply about a specific piece of content. See, I've did all these mistakes where I was speaking too, across too many pieces of content and too many topics. And a story that I share, Steve, is I shut down my award-winning podcast that was listed often in the top this is in the top that, lists of, you know, top podcasts. And the reason was 
was is I didn't do that. I was just interviewing anyone and everyone. It was called the Ambitious Entrepreneur Show. Now, the topics were relevant, but my message got lost in the noise of my own podcast, and I knew that I needed to take a step back. What I didn't realize was it had become such a well-known and brand name. People reached out to me, messaged me. I had about half a dozen or so people who said, would you consider selling that. I didn't because we've got the Ambitious Entrepreneur Podcast Network. So I kind of wanted to keep that brand name. But that's the kind of thing that you really can do when you think about the brand name. You know, so many people call the show on their own personal brand, their own name. Now, look, that's okay if the end in mind, and that's a strategy that I share with people, you need to know what is the end in mind? What goal are you achieving? Now, if you call a show your own name, unless there is someone that's walking around that sounds like you, speaks like you, there is no way that you can sell that down the track. And when you think about this piece of content and this you know, platform that you're building, you can sell that. If you've got a website too, that's very much branded and aligned with with that message. You think of some of the major websites that have been uh, built up, the online digital newspapers and so forth that have had a you know incredible audience and numbers and they've been sold down the track. So these are all things that you can think of at the time that you're strategizing that rather than just pick up a microphone and let's get it out there. So that's really what I share with people first before you start. You know, worry about them. Uh, don't worry about the make and model of the microphone because you can't edit and mix compelling content that nurtures your customers, converts your customers from fluff and banter. You just can't. Um, yeah, it's true. So. If if it's of any interest or use to the listener, they will put up with so much. They will put up with shoddy pictures. They're, they're probably less tolerant, actually, of the sound, and the sound is important, but you can achieve so much these days on such basic equipment. E even your smartphone is a fantastic little mobile studio that you can carry around with you, and the microphones in that for many, many things are just perfect for interviewing with. And, in fact, a lot of the content that we hear on the radio, it, particularly when it's actuality on newscasts, is probably recorded on somebody's smartphone anyway. So it just goes to show. I was going to ask you... A, a question that and we've kind of prepped this, which is the right thing to do, because I think preparation is so, so important that so many people will turn the microphones on and go, right, what are we going to talk about then? And that is the wrong way to be approaching one of these. What do you think then are the your what are the indications, do you think, that people should recognize to see that they're not ready to start a podcast? What? What are those initial things? Do they do they rock up to the microphone? They've got all the gear. They turn on. It's the first indication that they feel they've got absolutely nothing to say or they're not adding to the conversation. What's your advice to them? That is so important. And when I ask someone, why are you starting a podcast? If I hear, well, we're sharing our message and it's not cutting through the noise and we've heard that podcasting is a great way to build our reach, which is why we're thinking of starting a podcast. That are, that rings alarm bells for me because what I say to people is your podcast is an amplification vehicle. It takes your current existing message and it amplifies that across various channels. If your message isn't already working when you're sharing it across social, when you're going to a networking event and if you're sitting full of a room of your ideal clients and no one's ears prick up as soon as you share what it is that you do and how you can support people, focus on getting that right first. And in actual fact, I've been working with a group of, of entrepreneurs who've been developing their message, their signature programs, and then what we call your digital asset, which is a quiz. And when they're sharing that online and then generating some VIP clients and generating interest and inquiries, then we know, well, your message is starting to not only cut through the noise, but it's getting inquiries and generating clients. Now it's ready to uh, put a robust podcast strategy on top of that. So message is so important. It will amplify, your podcast will amplify your existing message. So if that's not working, don't start yet. Focus on that as well. Another thing that you need to be mindful of too, Steve, is that you may have a podcast topic that there are hundreds or even in some instances, tens of thousands of similar podcasts. You need to spend time on, well, what am I doing that's different? Is the message deeper? Are we talking about certain areas in that industry that no one else is covering? Yourself, what makes you different? The experience that you create 
if you know what that is, what's that unique special thing about you, and it could be your sense of humour or your ability to engage with your guests or even just tell a story where people are mesmerised from the minute you say once upon a time to the end. And so when you know what that is, you bring that forward to every single episode if you're interviewing, if you're doing a solo show, because what happens is people, and this is what I say also, Steve, people will come for the topic but they'll return for the host, you. Because what often happens is you, you'll launch a podcast episode and it'll be on a topic, let's just say SEO for small businesses. And someone will see that in their feed and they'll go, oh, I like that. I'm, I'm struggling with that. Let's have a listen to that. The intro's good. Who's this guy, Steve Highland? Oh, I haven't heard about him before. Oh, I like him. He's professional, got nice sound quality, introduces the show well, his guest is wonderful. I love the way that he interacts and engages with it. That was interesting. I might go and listen to another show of Steve's. And before you know it, they've listened to two and then three and they go, you know what, I'm subscribing to that show. Then they will maybe will binge listen. But that's the kind of thing that happens. People come for the topic and they'll return for the host. And what I've often found too, Steve, is that if I, it is my ideal client, not only will I binge listen to the entire show, but I've had people then ring me and say, look, I've been listening to your podcast. I've been stalking you across the different platforms. I think we need to talk. Because if they've just spent, you know, looking, uh, listening to 30, 40, 50, 60 shows, and each is minimum half an hour, that is a long time that they've been spending with you. Now, I don't know what other platforms allows you to spend time with people and you're not even there and you're building that know, like and trust as that trusted authority because this content that you've created, you've taken the time to consistently share a message that really is cutting through the noise and it, in a way that's authentic to you and, and that really stands out. I think that's pretty awesome. I mean, it's interesting you say that because we always approach many of the the, the the content that we produce, both our podcasts, our webinars, all that proposition, resolution, call to action. We, if we want them to do something, and I think a lot of people, uh, they approach, they don't approach them quite like that. They they tend to. There is this thing about the length of time that somebody listens to something, which seems to be once again this vanity uh, by numbers. And I have seen that people will just not get to the point because. They feel it's more important that somebody's listened for a long time as opposed to got any actual benefit from, from uh, what they're listening to. I remember when I was doing shopping telly, uh, a sale, when you were talking on screen about a particular product, the first thing you would say is, so this is what I'm, I'm going to be selling you this pen. You've probably made up your mind already, some of you. You want the pen. So here's how you get it. So straight away, you would go in with a call to action, explaining to them that, you know, there it is. If you want it, get it, get it now. And then what you would do is then you would then bring some of the um, the other explanations in afterwards, some of the other things that would, the other benefits of the product you were selling. And then people would buy on those benefits and you would bring up the objections and you would move the objections aside. So is it having a roadmap like, this is a long question, short answer, is it, is it having a roadmap like that that is essential for anybody that is presenting a podcast, do you feel? It is essential. And it is also essential to identify, again, this is end in mind, where are we using this podcast to consider along the customer journey? And what I mean by that is if you are using a podcast as a way to reach out to people who don't yet know you, you are not going to spend a lot of time sharing things about what you did over the weekend and some more personal details. However, if you're using your podcast in the customer journey where people are already buying from you, they may be in your membership program, and you're using your podcast as a way to nurture those existing customers into a higher level program, because they know, like, and trust you already, we tend to, when we, when we have that with a potential you know, supplier or someone that a mentor or a coach, we are more interested in who they are. I don't know about you, but I love the behind the scenes and I love that. And so I want to know a little bit more about that, the behind the scenes in the yep. podcast. I would share more of that. You would not do that if someone is only finding out about you because it's like, well, who cares? I don't care what you did in the weekend, <laughs> but someone already knows you and likes you and trusts you already has. So you need to consider that. But how you've, you mentioned earlier about tell people what they're going to walk away with. 
because I would assume that many of the listeners are an adult audience and adult audiences have limited time. They are skeptics. What am I going to learn from this? And why should I give you 20 minutes, 30 minutes of my time? And so you need to capture their attention. Are you struggling with SEO for you, SME? You've tried everything, yet your website is still 101 on the Google search. Well, today I'm joined by Keith Banfield, who's going to share three tips on how to stand out with SEO secrets that no one else knows about. Come and listen to the show. I mean, that kind of thing, if I'm struggling with SEO, I'm saying, Steve, um, pen and paper is ready. And then you'll yeah. dive in more into the story. And, and, and it's exactly the same thing when you're writing blogs as well, isn't it? That, it? that people are looking for information. Interesting questions just coming from Linda. Uh, she says, have you ever changed the nature of your podcast uh, based on feedback from your audience? Yes, that's a great idea. If, say, for instance, you reached out to your audience and they said, look, we would love for, for you, Linda, to do a few Q&As. Well, I would perhaps do one show just on Q&As or I may look at my program lineup and incorporate a Q&A. So it has to fit in for me. It has to fit in with the topic and the area where I'm building my reputation as that trusted authority, as that thought leadership. So if it aligns with that and it adds value to my ideal customer or my existing audience of customers, then sure, I would really listen to that, take heed and see how can I incorporate the feedback that I am getting and to assure that that's what, what, they're, what they're achieving and, and what I'm delivering. So great question. What's the, um, before we have a little break, what is the one thing you find yourself saying to new clients when they come into you? Uh, the, the, the one thing, the one piece of knowledge that you give them, but you find yourself repeating it endlessly. So every new client you go into, you always say this piece of advice to them. Is there a piece of advice like that that you would say to yeah. somebody? And it's a duo and, and it touches on something that you mentioned earlier, Steve. But I always start off by saying the good news is it's easy to start a podcast. The bad news is it's easy to start a podcast. So just because you could doesn't mean you should yet. And please don't focus on vanity numbers, being top of the charts on Apple, because that is going to make me a successful podcaster. It's not. You could have a million downloads and still not generate real ROI from your podcast. So take the time to really focus on that message, get clarity around what you are going to deliver as far as topics is concerned, have some format that you've got clarity around whether you're going to have guests or whether you're going to do solo shows or maybe a mixture of both and really make sure that you do some some deep, deep thinking and come up with that robust podcast strategy because the last thing that you want to do is get like some people who've done 100 shows or 73 shows or even 20-something shows and really have not generated any return on investment and it takes time and commitment to put one of these together. So take the time, think of the outcome that you want and then build a robust strategy to ensure that you're achieving your goals. Fantastic. More from Anne-Marie in just a few moments' time. My guest on today's show is Anne-Marie. She's the CEO, Anne-Marie Cross. She's the CEO and founder of the Ambitious Entrepreneur Podcast Network, the founder of Industry Thought Leader Academy, and she's also the author of Industry Thought Leader. Uh, you can get the book on Amazon, but there's more about that later on. Uh, how to go from invisible to influential and profitable with a podcast. We've got more from Anne-Marie coming up in a few moments' time. You're watching Business Connections Live. It's great to have your company today, and uh, I hope you're finding it useful. I know a lot of people that I speak to, uh, they're saying to me, look, do we, should we be doing a podcast? And how should we start it? How do we go about it? And as you can hear, there, there are a few fundamental questions that you must ask yourself before you go down the route. And we're going to give you some more clues, some more things that you should be checking out. There's a very interesting uh, link that we're going to be giving you later on as well, where it'll take you to Anne-Marie's website. And you can actually do a little test there to see if you are ready to start your podcasting career. And it's interesting, you know, with podcasting from small acorns, oak trees can grow and you never know what the success may well be. And every so often it's going to come along. There is going to be a podcast producer. There's going to be someone creating a podcast. And what that's going to do is it's just going to change everything, not only for their listeners, but also for them as well. So more about how to create and make a profitable podcast from Amory Cross in just a few moments time. You're watching Business Connections Live. Great to have your company, as I said, as always. Let's go back a couple of weeks. We had Keith Banfield on the program, and we were talking about how to co 
create a system that will generate leads for your business. And more importantly, it will generate leads for your business on autopilot. Does that sound like a good idea for your business? With the key takeaways from Proben, here's Keith. Okay, so I'm Keith Banfield, and uh, I'm from Brisbane. My business is Business Results Club. Well, one of them, I've got uh, more than one. And so the key takeaways, uh, I would say, are if you want to uh, alleviate the feast, uh, sorry, the famine and have more feast, you need to have a marketing system. You need something that's scalable and duplicatable. You need to test and measure and find out what works on a small scale I like Facebook because that's where people are addicted to looking. And I, if I'm going to place advertising, I want to put it where my customers are looking. And so uh, I place ads in their news feeds. And I like to then build up that relationship using a, an automated system like automated webinars and taking them from that into a strategy call where we see if there's a good fit for what I'm offering and whether they can afford it and whether that they um, whether they're right to then take them into a longer call where we'd make that final sale. So the key is to have systems and don't just rely on referrals, don't just rely on word of mouth. Because if you do that, you're not in charge of it and it's not scalable and that's what stops you from really dialing in the amount of business that perhaps you really want. Well worth checking out that entire program, actually. A real hour of great advice from Keith. So just go to our website. I'll give you where you can go in just a few moments' time. It's great to have your company. Here we are We're on the Monday. If you'd like to get in touch with us here at uh, Business Connections Live, it's very easy to do. You can drop us an email to studio at businessconnectionslive.com. Better still, why not pick up the phone as we're talking about all things audible, you can pick the phone up and give us a ring on 01784 256 777. Uh, you can follow our stream of consciousness at BCL Business TV, if you wish. But the best place to go for a whole load of information is to go to our website at Business Connections Live. Dot com. Go along there. There's over 400 hours of great advice. And it was interesting what uh, Anne-Marie was saying a few moments ago about finding your niche. I mean, we are... We target programs at so many different niches. And if you go through our programs, there are programs that are there that are going to be suitable for all sorts of different topics. And it does make you wonder, should you just have a single channel that is concentrating, shall we say, on lead generation? And that's all you do your programs on. In fact, that's a good question to ask. Should we do that? My guest today. Should you niche down that far? Well, if your expertise is in the area of lead generation, then what you want to do is obviously really speak into that, that area, speak into the challenges that your ideal customer is faced with. You want to bring your thought leadership into that area. But remember, your podcast doesn't just need to be you sharing your, your message and solo shows. What you can also do as part of your program is to think about a content strategy. Who can I go out and find who is an expert in the area of maybe lead generation, but other areas that you know your ideal client is struggling with so that you are tapping into someone else's community because what will often happen is when people are interviewed on your podcast, they will want to then share that with their community because it's validation that, hey, I've just been on Steve Highland's show. It's a great show, UK's leading show. And here is my interview, which means that you get your message in front of their audience too. So a great way to expand your audience, great way to bring value to your existing audience that you know is going to be struggling with maybe some of the areas that those guests share. So that's what I would do, Steve, is look at your content strategy. So obviously you speak about the area of lead generation, bring other people onto the show. But when you do a mind map, there are so many different branches, if you will, that you could dive deeply into that talks about lead generation. I mean, you think of what's happened in the world today. I am sure that there are changes in the industry, in the tools and technologies that are now available to us. I know that because of so much more noise online, we talk about fake news online, media and, you know, politics, government organisations. There is, because of what's been going on and that, that fake news, there is a lot less 
robust and skepticism, which means when it comes to lead generation, you may also be now speaking about the change in consumer, in, in consumer trust and buyer habits. So, you know, the, the, the scope of what you're sharing about lead generation can be vast. You could probably come up with 100 different topics that you could talk about all leading and adding value in that particular area. Does that make sense? It does. It makes absolute sense. And it kind of says that, for instance, from our point of view, what we do, um, we are we are the conduit that is bringing information to businesses. But for maybe somebody else's podcast, it is absolutely acceptable for you to be the conduit that brings information on a niche within your industry. So that's fine. And I, I think that really works well. Here's a question. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda's interested in this because... Uh, Linda, for a long time, uh, was booking our guests. And sometimes it can be quite laborious, can't it? It can be hard work to get the appropriate guest, to get someone who can talk. How do you find your guests? Let me just bring that up again. How do you find your guests? And uh, what criteria do you use when you're selecting your guests to get on the podcast? Suppose, number one, they've got to be able to string a sentence together. Well, that does help. That does help. But what I find is that I'm really interested in looking for ways that they have challenged the status quo, that they're bringing innovation to the content that they're sharing. What are they doing differently? What challenges have they overcome? And because of that, they've come up with systems and new ways of approaching. So I don't want to have the same old, same old show. I, I tell you, uh, Steve, I remember when I was doing a couple of the last shows of the Ambitious Entrepreneur Show, I got so bored. That's when I know that it's about time that I pack up. When I sit there, it was an audio only, but I was almost falling asleep. And I was thinking to myself, if I hear one more person say, I'm going to hack this and hack that, I'm going to hack off my fingers. <laughs> Not really, but you know what I mean. And so <laughs> this is really important to consider when you are positioning yourself, don't just share the same old, same old that everyone else is sharing. What is different? What is unique? Have you got a unique angle in your own story that demonstrates what I call milestones and markers that really set you apart that you know we could dive deep into that story and, and go wow this is amazing let's dive deep into how you got through that and why that's relevant now today for listeners well for the person who is sitting there struggling with what you've gone through as well so that's the kind of thing that I'm looking for and I don't care that they've been on Oprah or whatever to me it doesn't matter. I mean, I want to know how are you going to add value to my audience and what value are you bringing rather than you tooting your own horn and saying how good you are, what value are you going to bring to my audience? Are they going to be wiser? Are they going to be, uh, you know, prompted to think differently because they have spent 20, 30 minutes listening to, to you sharing some pretty um innovative innovative insights that's what that really stands Re out really really good answer actually uh interesting as well the uh, uh this is just a pet hate of ours i think uh here uh the constant use of the word passionate uh is uh, you know i'm passionate uh the other one that i'm still trying to get a definition for is being authentic i'm yeah. really me there's no this is it it gets no better than this i am authentic to what I am. Listen, let, let's get down to nitty gritty because I did ask you to put some key points down and I've, we've kind of meandered yeah. around them a wee bit and I just want to get them in, in place because I think they're really, really important. So I, I shall look down for a moment away from the camera to read them out in a style that is appropriate. Three common things most businesses become fixated at when starting their podcast and why they shouldn't if they want their pod podcast to generate real ROI. So what are the three those three common things that they get fixated on. So the first one we've spoken about, and that is that if I buy an expensive microphone, immediately my podcast is going to be a success. Well, as you would have heard both Steve and I at Share, not at all. Um, people could still be turned off if you are starting your show with fluff and banter, you haven't considered your message. There's nothing worse than it taking minutes, even if you're a co-host, minutes to get to the point of the point of the point that you're talking about. Get to the point, compel us, tell us why you're sharing this particular topic and why it's relevant for us. 
As I mentioned earlier, you can't edit and mix compelling content that converts from fluff and banter. And you said something earlier, Steve, and I want to just repeat that because I think it's valid and relates to what we're talking about. You may have one opportunity to attract the attention of who someone who could be your ideal client, yet you've spent the you know, 30, 60, 90 seconds droning on about nothing much and suddenly that person's gone next and you'll never get an opportunity to reconnect. The, with there is actually an expression for it in the radio industry which we could never repeat on air. Uh, but it, it is it's something to do with click. Uh, so, and it's very true, you know, the, the, the quicker they get to the button to switch you off, um, that's the amount of time you have. What do, Just before you go on to the next couple of points... Do you think we are becoming uh, less considerate when it comes to the amount of time that we allow people to get their points over? Because I, 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 my opinion is that the reason people turn off quicker these days is because what they're listening to isn't of particular interest. If it was more engaging, then people would listen for longer. Every night I will sit down and watch the TV. I will become engaged with a program and I will give it half an hour, an hour, even two hours. Um, but we hear all the time that the analytics show that online people listen for seven or ten seconds. Is it just because the content that they're listening to is rubbish? You know, it's interesting you should say that. I'm not really one for comedy. Shock horror, I know. But there's a gentleman, Michael McIntyre. I mean, he is hilarious. Now, not just the content he uses, but the way he delivers the content. And I see something scrolling through my feed on Facebook and I just cannot help but click onto his show because I know what he's sharing is going to be hilarious and the way he just speaks. So similarly, Steve, to what you were saying, someone may be sharing a particular topic, but the way you deliver it resonates so much to that audience that they're going to listen. I asked this once on LinkedIn and I got feedback that validated this. I said, people come for the topic, they return for the host. And someone said, you know, I didn't really even consider that. But it's true. He said, I subscribe to a number of different shows, but if I'm pressed for time and I know I only have about 20 minutes, half an hour, I'll scroll through my feed and I'll go, oh, I listened to that one because of the host. Love the way that person brings the topic. Want to hang out with, with them for the next 20 or 30 minutes. So again, people will come for the host. And in that instance, he didn't really consider what topic they're talking about. He just knew that whatever was going to bring value. So you need to bring value. I think if someone has listened to your show, they love the style and the approach, the experience that you create. If you have a couple of topics that may not necessarily be of interest, that's not going to turn off your audience. They will come back. I've got a couple of people who I do listen to. There may be a topic I'll think, oh, I won't listen to that one. Or I may, if I'm driving in the car, I don't mind because there may be something that I didn't even know that I didn't know. But that that's okay. But again, if you, they have that charisma. I have what I've called, I don't know if we got time today to talk about it, but it's a quadrant called a podcasting positioning quadrant. And there's three key factors that you need to have in place to become a trusted authority. And that is relevant niche content. It is a community, highly engaged community that is, again, that niche. And you need to have charisma. And if you get those three things in place and you've got a high audience that's highly engaged and you're highly seen as an authority in your topic, you can become a trusted authority. Whereas if you've got low audience, low engaged audience, they're not really niched in any way uh, and there's a low authority so you're not really seen as an expert in anything you're an entertainer. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if you're wanting to use your podcast as a way to become an industry thought leader, a trusted authority, you need to have high audience and high, uh, you know, high authority. Then if you go up the scale, so you're up one up above, so you've got high audience, but not necessarily high authority, you can become and be seen as a celebrity, an influencer. This is where you may have some radio hosts who've got a highly engaged audience, but they're not necessarily selling their expertise. They're selling entertainment or people are interested in knowing what they're going on about and what they did on the weekend and all that kind of stuff. So highly engaged audience, 
not necessarily high authority. Then on the bottom rung, when you've got low audience and high authority, you're seen as that expert. Well, again, people come for the topic, they're interested, they want to hear that specific thing and they listen and off they go because there's no charisma. But if you've got all of those three things, content, community and charisma, that is when you've got highly engaged audience, high level of authority, you're at the top of the quadrant as that trusted authority. Does that make sense? That's what you really want to aim towards. Yeah, um, it, it makes absolute sense. I was just wondering, does that fit in with your seven core principles that you you talk about when you do presentations on podcasting? Because I know we were going to talk about three of them, and that seems to have covered yes, a couple of them kind there, of actually, public. doesn't it, in, in a bigger light? Yes, but, it, it definitely does. Just you mentioned earlier about the three key mysteries. So the one we talked about was the microphone. Don't worry about the microphone. Focus on your message. The second was, I love this one. You might have heard this before as well, uh, Steve. I'm just going to publish my podcast and audience and clients are going to come in droves. Well, remember that time when we all thought, I've just launched my website. I better just not, you know buckle down. The uh, People are going to come storming through my website and and, and I'm going to be able to cater to all of the the clients that I'm getting. It just doesn't happen. Putting your podcast out there is step one. You still need to have a solid strategy to be able to get new audience, to re-engage existing audience so that they want to come back. So yeah, that that needs to be busted. And the third one is mentioned already where if you get listed on new and noteworthy, it's not going to be a success instantly. You still need to have relevancy around your topic and niche audience and have what I call a strategic seed and lead strategy so that people who are on your, uh, who are your ideal client, who've just come to a show, know that, hey, I've got something else. So, so often the call to action may be, well, subscribe to my podcast, uh, leave a rating, which are all right. There's nothing wrong with that. But for that smaller audience who are stuck and who are ready to make that move, let them know what is that next step? What is that call to action? And that's another strategy that I'll teach you. I can share that a little bit later. And it's one of the principles. Uh, I mean, Steve, it's interesting, you know. is it? Because there, there are podcasts out there that actually have no defined purpose. They are, as we were saying earlier on, they are just somebody talking. They're just a ramble. They're just getting it off their chest. And they're forgetting that what's in it for the listener? What is in, there, in it for the listener? What are the benefits? Why should they? Give, it, give their time to listen to your, your particular podcast. Uh, we've had another little note in here um, uh, from Bippin. He says, sorry, missed that. What was it? If you can give us a little bit of a clue which bit you missed, then we can go back and we can cover it again. But uh, thank you very much. It's good to know that you're there as well. Uh, by the way, you're watching Business Connections Live. Steve Harlan with you here. My guest today is Anne-Marie, um, and she is the podcasting queen. There is no two ways about it. Uh, is that a name that you made up or is that the name that's been that was given to you that one day you woke up yeah. and that's how they were writing about you? <laughs> yeah. Look, Australians are, are like the UK. I mean, it's like, who is she? Big, big noting herself. So years ago when I had multiple podcasts and people heard how how much I love them, I mean, one of my guests once said, oh, you're the podcasting queen or the queen of podcasting. And then my colleagues and my community started referring to me as that, oh, you need to go and talk to Anne-Marie. She's the podcasting queen. So eventually when I decided I'm going to really hone in and let this become my niche, I thought, well, I better get over myself and embrace the title so I wish I had have come up with that name and and take credit for that but I can't it was a given and I just embraced that title that's what I say to my clients and my community do something and do it well and because someone once asked me well how do I become the queen of anything and I said well you know what you do you do something you do it well you do it day in and day out for a month for a year for two years ten years you know, and on. And then if you're really good at it, your audience and your community will identify that and they will start to come up with different names, hopefully that they're nice names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is exactly what happened to one of my clients. She's in the area of finance, a money planner she is. And so they call her the money lady. So guess what? She's now embraced that title. I'm the money lady because that's Fantastic. what her community started to refer to. Yeah. In, in your ex, in your experience, do you think there's any particular topic or title that does lend itself to podcasting and is more successful, or 
is it very much a case of targeting the appropriate audience? And you can really talk about just about anything. Are you talking about the title of perhaps the name of the podcast? Not the, not the individual title, but maybe the the, the overall t- um, topic that the, the podcast is about. So, for instance, um, is there a particular industry sector? That's what I suppose I mean, an industry sector. Do you think there are some that work better for podcasting than others? Well, it's interesting you should say that because when I am speaking with someone who's looking at coming up for a name, we always look at a number of different things. I mean, it needs to be on brand. And what I mean by that is that it needs to be relevant and and so specific to the areas where this particular person is, is developing their business name and the insights that they're sharing. But it also needs to tap across into what the audience is looking for. So I will often look at what are your audience, your ideal clients, what are they searching for on Google? Are there certain keywords and phrases that you can incorporate into the overall name of your podcast? And if it's if it's a name that has a promise of value and a promise of expectation, it is lock that in and go and get the URL uh, as quickly as you can. For instance, Women in Leadership podcast, that podcast hasn't been produced for, for a little while now. It still gets downloads every single day from various shows and whenever I mention I might start that up oh please please do because the hashtag women in leadership is one that is constantly being spoken about it is absolutely relevant and I know that there is a huge amount of content being shared different content of course but women in leadership captures that really nicely so if you can because I'm not going to talk about rocket science on women in leadership so there's a promise of expectation that I'm going to be talking about leadership now I might interview a woman <laughs> in leadership in NASA or something but you know at least it has some promise of value and expectation that someone is going to walk away being inspired with leadership skills and insights listening to that podcast of course there are two sides of this aren't there there, there are the podcast producers and then there are, there are the people who come onto the podcast and be interviewed and um james has come up with this how do you become a guest on a podcast is, is and, and is it worth doing as well for that matter is it good to be a guest is it is it good to to get a reputation to go out there and you know to raise your profile by being a guest with different podcasters Yes. Great, great question, James. And how are you? You know, this lean in and I'll share a little secret with you. This is what you do. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Ask. (laughs) Just ask. I mean, just ask. But there are some things that you need to consider. Number What what you should do is just just ask. Yeah. They can at least say no, can't they? Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you've got... Three key points. This is what I will often say to people. Give a little paragraph about what it is. It's a nice little summing paragraph. Three key takeaways that you're uh, going to share of value to my audience and then wrap that up a little bit. That's all I really need. And then maybe some links to other podcasts just so that I can go and have a listen. And please, these are some of the must, the musts, and then the please don't do this. So go and have a listen to some of my shows. If you can share some of the previous guests that I have had on the show, maybe you can add value to a specific topic that one of my previous guests has spoken about, but you can go deeper into that or perhaps share a completely different angle that I might not have even considered. But what you don't want to do is this is, I can't believe that some PR agents do this. They send out a blanket email to dear and then name and then they forget to actually write the name down or they state a podcast name that's not actually mine because they've forgotten to change you know to, to change the name of the podcast or they'll reach out and they'll ask to become a guest on a podcast that was only produced for a client if they'd done a bit of homework they would see that we haven't produced a show since 2010 believe it or not my co-host still gets requests to come on career success radio Radio, and we only produced that between 2008 and 2010. So please do your homework. And, yeah, ask, ask, approach. approach I think that's the best thing they? to do. Uh, tell us a little bit about the website because there seems to be uh, – before uh, we've got more questions to come, obviously, and I've got another little bit I've got to play in. Uh, but the website looks quite interesting. Just talk us through the website at the moment. There's all sorts of good resources on here, aren't there? 
Yes, yes. So that particular resource there is where I've created a quiz. And so podcastingwithpurpose.com forward slash quiz. There's five different pillars oh, that I that. will offer. There we go. Yeah. So make sure that these pillars and the various components within each pillar is in place. And this speaks into what you are talking about, Steve, guesting on other podcasts. I've had someone say to me, I've been on over 50 podcasts. And I've said, that's fantastic. How many leads and inquiries have you generated from that? And they've said, oh, not really, but I've got lots of exposure. Well, look, that's fantastic. Exposure is really good. But before you launch a podcast, similarly, before you go guesting, what is your call to action? And I've also had some debates and discussions with people about this as well. For those of us who love listening to podcasts, we do that because it's often a secondary activity when we're traveling, commuting, running. I love listening to catching up on podcasts because I can turn people on double speed because I just love, give me the information, no fluff and banter, double speed's fine for me. But what I do is that you 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 are so keen on listening to that, that when you go and share content, then you've got this consistency that's going there. Does that make sense, Steve? So please, please, please yep. make sure that you've got a call to, to call to action. That is, if you're going to be podcast interviewing and sharing your content, make it something that's audio because people are not going to go and read long ebooks yet. You've got to win their, you know, their trust and their time that they're going to spend with you first. Start slowly by giving them a resource that is in exactly the same mode of communication that they're listening to. So if they're listening to a podcast, give them a free call to action or a call to action with a free resource that is an audio podcast rather yeah, really, than uh, an ebook. Yeah. Really interesting. Uh, Martin Quinn's uh, a great point is actually. I mean, we were talking about being prepared and making it, getting it in the right, the right context. But he says that a lot of PRs are under too much pressure to just get the message out there and perhaps not do their research. And that's true, isn't it? A lot of us do. We we hit the ground running, but we're unprepared for that run in many respects. And and we see that a lot in podcasting, don't we? Yeah, you know that that kind of thing for me really does frighten me, and the reason is that every and I'm a brand strategist by trade, so I will harp on about this till you know the day I die. Every communication, every interaction, every conversation, every tweet, post, email, and reaching out if you're if you're hiring a PR agent speaks your brand. So if your PR agent is not doing their homework and positions you in a less than professional way, it's not your PR agent that is going to bear the brunt of it. It is you. It's just like any strategy. If you hire someone to do a, you know, outreach on LinkedIn and they're messaging rapidly and you haven't told them that once you get to that stage, I'm going to take over because this relationship that you're building is so important to me. I don't want to seem like I'm giving a canned message. You've, as you've said, and we've said, Steve, you've only got one opportunity to make a good impression. And if you are not making a good impression on the onset, then that may just be your chance to get in front of an audience who would have loved to hear from you and that connection that you would have built with that host and, and with that that podcast network it may be a missed opportunity so I say take the time to do the right research I would much rather have fewer shows and be on smaller niched audiences who are very much aligned and interested in what I'm sharing than be across a thousand or a hundred or whatever podcasts for the sake of podcasting. I'll, I'll say to people, stop And that is the other thing, is it? Don't be doing it yeah. for the sake of doing it. Do it no, for a reason. Not, stop worrying Have about a vanity metrics. Yeah. Not vanity metrics. What you need to be focused on, this is one of my principles, is focus on building reputation equity because your reputation and the reputation you build in your marketplace is bankable. You can take that to the bank because people trust you. And I was talking to um, to someone the other day and they were saying, you know, that is absolutely right. I, If I admire someone so much so and I've been following them for years, they'll send me an email and say, we've launched a course, I'm in. By the way, what's the course about? That's what happens when you build a relationship. I'm in. But by the way, what are we studying? What are we doing? That's the kind of relationship that you can build. 
God, I wish I could. I wish I could do a course like that. Listen, we've got another question that because we're, we're we're nearly at the end of the hour. What time is it where you are, by the way? At eleven fifty-five p.m. Yeah, you, and you're looking so, absolutely that, radiant that, on it, if you don't mind me saying. After a hard day, you're doing this. I mean, it's midday. It's just gone. Well, it's coming up to one o'clock here, but, you know, we really appreciate it. Um, the next question I'm going to ask you in just a moment, the one simple yet powerful unknown tactic that will enable you to nurture listeners into leads, inquiries, and ultimately customers from your very first episode. That is a big claim, young lady. I'd like you to think about that. And we will talk to you again in just a few moments' time. Uh, Anne-Marie Cross is my guest on today's show. I hope you're enjoying it today. It's been a real insight. By the way, she's got a book out as well. You can find it on Amazon. It's called The Industry Thought Leader. She'll tell us more about that in just a few moments' time. I haven't got my copy off it yet. Been thumbing through what they allow you to see online and it looks like it could be the very book that you need to have in your library if you are thinking about starting a podcast in your particular market sector. So if I was you, I would go out and I would check that one out and uh, see if it gives you the information that you require. More for Anne-Marie in just a few moments' time. Uh, but uh, here's a guy called Martin Campbell. He used to be at Off Ofcom. And uh, I asked him about the role of the media uh, these days when it comes to broadcasting. And I thought it was rather apt to hear his uh, dulcet tones on this particular program. So from a man that was at the very top of the game and still is when it comes to advising journalists on what they can report, it's Martin Campbell. I'm Martin Campbell. I'm a media advisor. I work with media objectives. I've got one golden rule for businesses. All the rest is important, but just remember this one. And it comes, it's not mine, comes from Bernard Ingham, who said, never, ever say anything in any circumstances that you don't want to see in print or hear broadcast. Great advice. Short and sweet and to the point. Nothing is ever off the record, so be aware of that. Uh, by the way, this is a, a nice comment as well. I think you'll appreciate this one. It says, uh, thank you, really enjoyed the programme. Hope you get some sleep soon. So there we go. So you, you'll be straight, it'll be a cup of cocoa and straight to bed after this, won't it? For you? Yes. Yes? I yeah. think so. Although I am, I can be a bit of a night owl, so hopefully I um, will be able to get some sleep. But that's good. That's good. The trouble I love with this that, is... Uh, before, by the way, Steve, that was good. That was good. Once it's yeah, out good. there, it's out. Is it once? It, and it's true. When we when we do our media training, we talk about this, and it's you know it's so easy. I think when the journalist, when you're walking into a studio, a radio studio, a TV studio, and the journalist saying, "Oh, hello there, Fred. How's it all going? A bit of a tough time at the moment. Whew, yeah, a bit of a tough time. Don't really want to talk about that." So what are they going to ask you questions on? They're going to ask you questions yeah. on the really tough stuff, and so nothing is ever off the record. And I think that's really good advice. So let's go back to that question, that uh, all seeing, all answering question, the one simple yet powerful unknown tactic that will enable you to nurture listeners into leads, inquiries, and ultimately customers from your very first episode. Before you answer, we had a thing that used to say, it takes two years to build an audience, two minutes for them to forget. This is quite a claim to be doing it from your very first episode. So Tell us more. Well, you know, Steve, how I mentioned to you that Women in Leadership podcast had three episodes launched, published on the website, and it took two people going through those three episodes to decide, I want to work with you. And I thought, hmm, so if I start a new podcast, imagine if the first three episodes was not me interviewing guests, which normally it would have been, but rather me taking my ideal client through the customer's journey of awareness building, of um you know, consideration, sharing a little bit more content and then decision, a little bit more content, then again, by nurturing them through the buyer's journey. Imagine if I did that with the first three episodes of my show. And then what if I created a transcript out of that and maybe even more resource, like a quiz, so that they could go through that and then very easily take a checklist, mark it off and see the gaps 
And then the podcast series that I create actually led them through that to the point where I spoke exactly with where their immediate need and challenge was and they would get many wins and then at the end of that series, which has, you know, a corresponding email, which is nurturing them through and I'm building that relationship over seven touches or however many touches I've decided to do that over a period of time, when they've gotten to know, like and trust me and have gone through that series, a call to action is, well, if you're ready, here's a link to my calendar. Let's have a chat. And so that's what I've done. Every single podcast that I now start and I recommend my clients do when they start is the first three episodes needs to be their podcast series that speaks into their ideal client's challenges and takes them through that journey. It's education, but to be able to access that and the resources that you include within that package, that free opt-in, that giveaway, they need to opt in. They need to give an exchange of their email address and then they're on your list. Now, I've shared this with a number of people and it was interesting the feedback that I got and one of them which really uh, stood out for me and I realised that this was such a great strategy is how many times this particular person said, I listened to a podcast and I really loved the host but nowhere in any of her episodes, did she share who she was, what she does, how I could find out more about that. Her very first episode started with an interview and she'd done many interviews after that. And that kind of tells me that that person really wasn't clear on their niche, their message, the call to action, the outcome. But that's why you can start to generate leads, inquiries and ultimately paying customers because at the end of any of the ongoing shows, one of the things that you will say is if you've liked this episode, you want to dive deeper, go and connect with my guest. Or if you have not yet already signed up for my three-part podcast series where I take you through how to go from invisible to influential and profitable and start to nurture your listeners into leads from your first episode, I share all in my podcast series. All you need to go is to annemariecross.com forward slash podcast series and it'll be straight into your inbox immediately. And that's your call to action. And then guess what? When I'm interviewing a guest and that guest shares that with their community, their community is going to hear me share that call to action too. And it's a subtle call to action for those people who are ready to make that move, that step that may just be something that they've been looking for and have not been able to find. And that gentle call to action there will let them know that that's available. And that's from the very first episode. Actually, you should be doing leading that seeding and leading from episode zero, actually. But the three part series is, is a really good strategy. But that's very interesting because that is a proper call to action. You are putting calls to action in there. And as I said at the very beginning, I think we, we agreed that a lot of people, when they do their podcasts, um, they just leave people just hanging there. There is, they don't want them though, don't ask them to do anything. It's just, that's it. It's finished. Bye. Join us again soon. Subscribe. Perhaps is the one thing that a lot of people say. And to be honest with you, if you're subscribing to maybe a YouTube kind of platform, you're not really getting the uh, the contact details that you need to grow your own list, are you? Right, you're not. And I love that podcast strategy for a number of different reasons. Not only can you include that in your own call to action for your podcast, if you are including a guesting strategy, so you're going to be a podcast guest on other people's podcasts, use that as your strategy, any media. Now imagine if you were on, on TV, you could say to people, look, I've only just scratched the surface. If you want to dive deeper, please go and access my podcast series. There's transcripts, there's other things that I've included in that here's the web link, then people who are ready to make that move because you've just shared some valuable tips and insights, they'll be rushing over to access that. And guess what? You've just generated a, a warm lead because people who have signed up for that have just shown that they're interested in that topic and therefore your nurturing strategy then comes into play from that. Final question. Here we are. We're doing we're on video so people can see what we look like. They can see the, the white of our eyes. Podcasting traditionally is audio. D do you see this as the future now or do you think we're going to we're gonna see two different genres coming along? There's going to be the video podcasts and the audio podcasts or will the two just merge together and what you'll get is a video podcast or you can have it without the pictures as an audio one? I mean, is, do you see that as a future? Is it all about being in vision or is it still all about the words that we say? 
I think it's both and it has been both for a little while. I do know when I started podcasting, it was audio only and I love that because I always say to people, you never have a bad hair day and you don't have to worry about your lipstick wearing off. Not that you'd have to worry about that, Steve, but uh, you know what I mean? When you've got the visual aspect, the there's a whole lot of nuances, you know, <laughs> nice colour on your hair. <laughs> Um, But I I think that there is a different audience. There are some people that just love the audio aspect of things. And it's interesting because I think there's a different audience. If I have a look at the live stream, there are some people that really love the live stream and that live aspect of being able to engage with the guests. There are others that do catch up on the audio or even the video later too. But one of the things that I'm hearing, and it's interesting to see if you've gotten feedback like this too, Steve, is that if there is is an audio proponent, oh, sorry, a video proponent of the content, what will often happen is people will either minimise that or they'll carry on in an activity and not be staring at the screen but still be listening. So yeah. uh, it, it just depends. I think now that we're seeing more people across the world being in some form of restrictions and lockdown and not so much commuting, it's interesting I've gotten feedback that some of the popular shows have found that their listener numbers have gone down yet live streaming and that kind of thing has increased because people are craving that kind of interaction, interaction. In, in some way being able to see but otherwise it tends to be more the listening because it's a secondary activity and you can just kind of listen while you're commuting that kind of thing and maybe catching up on emails and things like that so I think you've got to be really clear on who my audience is do research what do they prefer and be guided by that but I think an integrated and multi-channel approach in this world today is an important one because you've got some people who do like to watch, others who will like to listen, then they'll go across to LinkedIn and other platforms. So you really do need to have an integrated, robust strategy, not just one, but across multiple platforms because that's how you're going to build no luck and trust a lot quicker. Absolutely right. It's funny, I found myself actually, what I do now is I will watch uh, podcasts, but I'll run them at uh, double speed. And your ear very quickly gets attuned to it. So instead of it being an hour, it now becomes 30 minutes, but you're still absorbing all the information. But then on saying that, there are, uh, I remember when I was producing podcasts, I would sometimes leave errs in instead of de-erring it because sometimes the audience needs thinking time to take a point on. And the err yeah. can give them that thinking time. So it's very interesting that the whole psychology around this, I think, is fascinating. Listen, we've talked for an hour. It's well past your bedtime. You should be going to bed now. And I always ask my guests to give us the key takeaways from the program. There's been many on today's program. I think your counsel on this has been absolutely fantastic. It's been so informative. Love the idea of the book. Uh, can't wait to read it. Really looking forward to doing that. And also, I think I should also do the quiz as well, because just to get a feel for what you're achieving out there, where's the majority of your audience? Is it is it Australasia or is it worldwide now for what you're doing? It's interesting because I tended to get a lot of audience over in the US and in the weirdest of places, in actual fact, ambitious, and it changes, it changes from topic to topic. But when Ambitious Entrepreneur Show was in production, Steve, I was contacted by a listener, a long-term listener, and often we don't hear from our audience. So it is lovely when they reach out. And it was someone who'd been listening for quite some time and had been inspired and made career decisions on some of the insights that my guest shared. Anyway, he had become a radio host at a local radio show in Zimbabwe and they had something like 48% coverage across the nation. And they said to me, would you mind if we syndicated your show on our station? Because we would love to share the message to inspire aspiring entrepreneurs. So I'm sharing this as a way to kind of say, don't don't not get your message out there. You just don't know who's listening and where your voice will end up and who you will inspire and empower. And to think that my produced, home produced, home-based studio produced podcast was being played in a national radio station in Zimbabwe. Another one of my shows, The Christian Entrepreneur Show, was syndicated at a local radio station in Perth. You just don't know where your voice ends up, know. you know. How fantastic. Yeah. What, a, what a great, great feeling that is as well. And it just shows that you're, you're resonating with an audience, which is fabulous. Okay, key takeaways from today's program, please say who you are, where you're from, 
and the key takeaways nice and long and a call to action at the end. The airwaves and Marie Cross are all yours. So Anne-Marie Cross, also known as the Podcasting Queen, helping you go from invisible to influential and profitable with a podcast. If you want to build your reach, your reputation as a trusted authority, as well as your revenue from your very first uh, podcast, then uh, some of these principles will certainly help you. So just to recap some of the major points that I shared, don't worry about the make and model of the microphone. Focus first on your message, because when you add a robust podcast strategy on top of that, it means your podcast is going to cut through the noise and and be able to really position you as that trusted authority. Make sure you've got clarity on your lucrative niche. Don't worry about vanity numbers. Focus on reputation equity. How are you different? How are you showing up consistently? And ensure that you bring that across in each and every episode, whether you're interviewing someone or whether you are doing a solo show. Secondly, or thirdly, make sure that you're really clear on what I call your thought leader brand and message. And this is spending some time so that if someone was to keep compare your message and your brand to someone else who's in your industry, it is not only distinguishable, it is uncopyable and irresistible. And what I mean by that, the story that you are sharing across your podcast episodes, if someone were to remove you, your name and add their name and the story that you're sharing is similar, that means you're actually copyable, you're not uncopyable. So take some time to really cut, to get clarity on that key message and story that makes you unique. So do that and bring that across each and every podcast episode that you share. Uh, what's one other one that I want to share with you? Last but not least, make sure your call to action has people come, your ideal client who are ready to take that next step to go from your podcast to your list. And that is to really think about the first three episodes. Or if you've already launched a podcast, you can create a three-part series, special series, and start seeding and leading with your existing audience and say, hey, this is coming up. And in fact, actual fact, what I would do was I would engage your audience and find out what are some of the key triggers and challenges that they're faced with now and create that podcast series around that and launch that so that you have a call to action, an opt-in that has some strategic emails to nurture those listeners into those leads and then inquiries. And then every single time that you have that call to action or you, if you're doing a podcast guesting strategy or even you're part of mainstream media and you're being interviewed, you can use that as your opt-in and continue to build your list and work with awesome clients. If you want to find out more about my work, uh, go to podcastingwithpurpose.com forward slash quiz. And if you're wanting to find and get a copy of the book and find out more about that, industrythoughtleaderbook.com will take you there. What a professional. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a lot of fun. I've been really looking forward to this one. And uh, thank you so much. And as I said, I know it's late where you are at the moment, but it's been such a worthwhile program. And I think for UK and European businesses who want to get the inside track on how they should be starting their own podcast for their niche market to to give something to their audience out there, then I think this has been an invaluable first step. As I said, and as Anne-Marie said, do please go to our website and do check that out. You can find all the details by going to our website as well. If you go to businessconnectionslive.com, uh, you'll find a whole page of notes there about the particular program. That uh, Also, all the links that you need as well. You can either follow Anne-Marie or you can find her on LinkedIn and all the different places. But it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you ever so much indeed. Thank you, Steve, for the opportunity. All right. Now, don't you go away because I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping now and uh, we'll just pull it all to a close. Listen, thank you very much indeed for watching us on today's program. I hope you've enjoyed today's show and you found it useful. It's been a great show with Anne-Marie Cross. Uh, she was all the way over there in Australia, but the same rules apply. If you're thinking of starting a podcast, where do you start? Well, maybe the first place to start is by watching this program again and writing out some notes and getting hold of a copy of her book as well or going to her website. Listen, once again, from me, Steve Harlan, thank you very much for watching. And uh, here we are. We're heading up towards Christmas. We may squeeze one more program in before the fateful day. We may well do that. Uh, if not, stay safe out there. Regardless of what tier you're in in the UK, uh, be safe, look after each other, and have a wonderful Christmas if we don't speak again. But from me, Steve Harlan, it's bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.
Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel.